This is the Tabernacle, a church of imperfect people doing our best to love God, love people, and make disciples. My name is Britton. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so excited you decided to join us today. We're going to be in Psalm 23, so make sure to get your Bibles out and turn there with us. We're so excited about today's message. Also, don't forget, coming up, we have our Christmas Eve services. We're going to be live at both our locations for those, but also we're going to have an online option. You can tune into those at 7 o'clock p.m. on social media and on our website thetabchurch.com. We cannot wait to see you there. The Eternal is my shepherd. He cares for me always. He provides me rest and rich green fields beside streams of refreshing water. He soothes my fears. He makes me whole again steering me off worn hard paths to roads where truth and righteousness echo his name even in the unending shadows of death's darkness i am not overcome by fear because you are with me in those dark moments near with your protection and guidance i am comforted you spread out a table before me provisions in the midst of attack from my enemies. You care for all my needs, anointing my head with soothing, fragrant oil, filling my cup again and again with your grace. Certainly your faithful protection and loving provision will pursue me where I go, always, everywhere. Good evening. Hey, we are few, but as Victoria says, we are mighty, right? Are you glad to be here? Okay, good. I'm glad that you're here, and I need your help a little bit. Uh, For those of you that are uh, watching online, uh, you may not know, normally we uh, record the uh, Saturday night service. That's the uh, the one that we put online, and so we make an effort not to say good evening, but tomorrow they're going to have a live preacher, man, so I can talk right to you now. And we need to up our game Saturday night. I just want you to know, just a little bit, all right? So uh, this isn't a funeral. This is a church service is the first thing I want to say, and you fill in the rest of those blanks. But uh, uh, snow uh, dropped all the snow that we normally get at the end of October in November, and the first part of December was saved up, and it was dropped on uh, this part of northern Michigan today. So that's one of the reasons that we're few. Uh, A couple of things that I've noticed about northern Michigan is even though we get a lot of snow, especially this northwest pocket, uh, the first time snow drops, everyone acts like they've never seen snow before. Have you noticed that? Everyone drives stupid and they end up in the ditch. That's why the only place I drove today was church, (laughs) right? Just keep it real simple. Uh, But uh, normally Michigan drivers uh, were among the best. And the reason that I know this happened actually before I moved here. I've been in snowstorms in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been in snowstorms in Kentucky. I've been in snowstorms in Knoxville, Tennessee, Ohio, and Indiana, and even West Virginia. And whenever everyone's going 15 miles an hour in the right lane, and there's some guy in a big truck going 85 right by you, nine times out of 10, his license plate says Michigan. True fact, you, you'll see that next time, well, whatever, all right. So we're in our series, our Christmas series, Savior, Shepherd, King, and last weekend we looked at how the promised Savior, who is Jesus, we saw that spelled out pretty clearly in Psalm 22. This weekend we're looking at Psalm 23 because Jesus was also the promised Shepherd. As our Messiah, as the God in flesh, one of the things we celebrate as Christmas is that Christ is not just our Savior, he's also our shepherd. And in the intro video, uh, the reader was reading Psalm 23, one of the most beloved and most well-known psalms, actually one of the most well-known bits of scripture, period. The beautiful poem written by David, many of us know it as, oh, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. And even though he was reading it from probably the message version, uh, it was somewhat familiar, wasn't it? We know those words. And the words of Psalm 23 speak about this shepherd, but they also tell us about the character and the nature of Christ. And if we pay attention, it tells us something 
about how we relate to God and how we can relate to God. But before we dive in there, I, I, I want to take us back a little bit in Scripture. We're going to read just a couple of different ones. The first place in Scripture, we're not going to go there, but the first place in Scripture where we see God, Almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of everything, who's too big to even describe, the first time he's called a shepherd, I believe, is by the patriarch Jacob. So you've heard people say, well, uh, you know, God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? God first uh, revealed himself to the people of Israel through their father, Abraham, and he passed it on to his sons, Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob was one of the first ones to call God a shepherd. And that's pretty interesting because, you know, it's Christmas and we think about shepherds. In Luke chapter 2, one of the craziest parts of the Christmas story is that on the night that Jesus was born, in Luke 2, it says that angels appeared to shepherds who were tending their flocks by night. And we're like, oh, cool, I love the shepherds, right? Except in that culture, shepherds were looked down upon. Those were the guys who couldn't get any other job. You know, if you stay with us uh, in the new year through the Samuel series, when Jesse comes to anoint the future and greatest king of Israel, King David, uh, they almost forget about him because he's the youngest, he's the runt, he's out watching the flocks, he's a shepherd. And, and Jesse brought all his other sons thinking, oh, one of these will be the future king. And Sam is like, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, there's got to be more. Oh, you want the runt? Shepherds were kind of looked down upon, and in Luke 2, that was always one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story, when an angel appears. Can you imagine how freaked out these lowly Hebrew men were when all of a sudden the heavens open and there's an angel? I bring you good tidings of great joy. Okay, right? You're not going there with me? Come on. Imagine it. And, and, he, and he tells them, that in the city of David, in Bethlehem, a Savior is born, Christ the Lord. And he appeared to shepherds. It's pretty cool. And if they were paying attention in church, they would have known that there's a connection. You see, in Micah, in the book of Micah, the prophet Micah, a couple thousand years before, prophesied about this Messiah. So it wasn't just that in Psalm 22, there was a promised savior, the prophet Micah prophesied that there would be a promised shepherd. In verse 2 of Micah chapter 5, it says, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. And then down in verse 4, it says, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So there you have it. A prophet, thousand plus years before the birth of Christ, says, a shepherd will come, a Messiah will come, and he will care for them forever. They're not talking about David. They're not talking about some human shepherd. They're talking about the promised shepherd, the one whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. Isn't that cool? That's in Micah. And so as we continue to connect the dots, we go to the New Testament after the birth of Jesus. And remember, angels appeared to shepherds. And then we get to some of Jesus' most familiar teaching, if, if you've been around the church. And if you haven't, don't worry, I'm going to read it for you. In John chapter 10, Jesus is preaching, and Jesus often told stories and used images and metaphors that everyday people could understand. He didn't come for the most intelligent. He didn't come to the universities, although all those people came to hear him. He spoke so simple, working folk could understand. And in John chapter 10, he started speaking about sheep and shepherds. Because most people in that day and age would have understood sheep and shepherds. And it was in John chapter 10, in, in this sermon, in verse 11, when he proclaimed, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And, and this isn't a message about John chapter 10, but I commend it to you. It's a great 
little weekend reading. What does it have to do with Christmas? Everything, because at Christmas we celebrate the incarnation. We celebrate God come to earth as a man, God with us. This promised shepherd, and, and he teaches about how he is the good shepherd. But our focus is Psalm 23, and that's where we go next. So if you still have your Bible or device open, I want to read the familiar words of Psalm 23. Because Psalm 23 describes that good shepherd in detail. And this is how the Bible's all connected. So the prophet Micah promising that the Messiah will be a shepherd, the Messiah standing up in a sermon and saying, I am that good shepherd, and I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep. And King David, a thousand years beforehand, describes the good shepherd. You know, I was reading a commentary this week because that's what we preachers do, I guess. And one of the things that it said about Psalm 23 is that it, 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 it can't be improved upon. It's perfect in its six little verses. And although you can study it your whole life, you still can't plumb the depths of insight that you can get from these phrases. This is what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This is God's word. And the cool thing about Psalm 23 is we get a picture of the good shepherd and what the good shepherd does for us. And so again, last weekend, as we look for, as the promised savior, the promised savior uh, uh, pays for all of the sins of my past and my present and my future. But Psalm 23 talks about how the shepherd tends his flock right now. So a couple of observations, and, and, and you've heard it said before, I think some of you, that uh, sheep aren't known to be the smartest creatures in the barnyard, right? And I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that, but scripture tells us a lot about sheep. It says, we like sheep go astray or have gone astray. Sheep tend to wander off. They need a shepherd. Sheep are generally fearful a lot. Scripture talks about how uh, the flocks of sheep are scattered and can be scattered usually because of fear. Sheep that aren't taken care of are easy conquests for wolves and other wild animals. And so if you just think about just those general observations, isn't that just like us? Now I want to spend just one more moment here because uh, having lived here 18 years, uh, one thing that I've noticed about Northern Michigan folks is we like to be independent, we like to be self-sufficient, we like to think we have it all together. I don't know about Lansing and Detroit and Grand Rapids and the West Coast and the East Coast, but if the apocalypse comes, we in Michigan can survive, right? That's our attitude. And some of us d don't want to be compared to sheep. We'd like to think, well, you know, there are sheep, son, but then there are sheep dogs, and I'm a sheep dog you know, and start talking about Second Amendment and all this kind of stuff. Not trying to get political, I just want to say this. As a human being, try as you like, you're a sheep. We're all sheep. Every single one of us. We can stray. We tend towards fear. We can be scattered. And as independent and as hardcore and self-made as you think you are, you still need tending. You need a shepherd. And the question is, is who are you being shepherded by? Who will be your guide? And, and that's the picture that we get from Psalm 23. And it's a beautiful picture. And so there's just some thoughts that, that I thought that we should explore. And, and, and the first thing that jumps out just from verse 1, uh, many of us know the title of this psalm is the Lord is my 
shepherd. And, and one of my fears is because we're talking about such a familiar psalm to some of you that you're just going to check out. Please don't check out because there's no wasted words in Scripture and none of us can fully plumb the depths of any of it. So I'm hoping that there'll be something in here for you. Here's the first thing. It's obvious from verse 1 that the shepherd owns the sheep. The shepherd owns the sheep. Now, you might think, well, it says the Lord is my shepherd, but if I'm a sheep and I have a shepherd, who really owns who, right? So let's just imagine this scene. You walk up on a first century hillside and there's a flock of sheep and, and, and you don't see a bunch of sheep walking around on two legs like, yeah, that's my shepherd right over there. Yeah, he belongs to me. Now, make no mistake about it. The shepherd owns the sheep. Now, the author here, as a sheep, is identifying the Lord as his shepherd. But make no mistake, the sheep is owned by that shepherd, right? Now, I've never tended sheep, but I, I've done my homework. And I have been around some sheep, and I've been around some farms and some ranches. And one thing I've noticed is usually where there are flocks of sheep, get this, Sheep are marked. They're marked. And they're not always marked the same way, but they tend to be marked, at least in the first century, they were marked with a notch in their ear. When a sheep was born, they would, at a certain age, they would bring the, you know, the young lambs to, to a, a, a place where there was a hard surface. And you know, you'd have to hold the sheep down, but that shepherd would put his mark in the ear. Now we have other ways of piercing their ear and put a little tag on it or whatever. But when you're marketing sheep as a shepherd, you mark your sheep. And I thought that was interesting. And in the book of Exodus, Exodus 21, when God gives the people the law for the first time, you know, he's talking about free men and servants and slaves. And he even has a description in the book of Exodus for, well, what happens when a man wants to set his slave free and the slave doesn't want to go free? Well, that slave would be marked. And he would be marked in the same way or a similar way that, that I've just described. It says, when there is a slave who loves his master and the master loves his servant and he wants his servant to be free, but the servant wants to stay as a love slave and serve him, to stay in that household, that there was a ceremony where they would take the slave by the ear to the doorpost and they would take an owl and a hammer and they would pierce the ear. And so if you saw a man with that earring, he was a free man who had willingly submitted himself to the ownership of his master. What does that have to do with us? Shepherd owns the sheep. Well, there's a lot of people that have read Psalm 23 or memorized Psalm 23 or recited Psalm 23 or even go to Psalm 23 when they're in desperate need. You know, I've read stories about the Titanic as it sank. You know, you've heard stories about the band playing and staying at their posts and women and children first. And some of the stories also include as the ship began to go beneath the waves, of course, some people are panicking and some people are trying desperately to survive, but there was a group of people that just joined together and recited together Psalm 23. Their last words before the cold, icy waters, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But you can know the verse and not know the shepherd. You can recite the verse and not know the shepherd. You can request that it be read at your funeral or at your deathbed and still not know the shepherd. You can spend your whole life relating to God through Christ as if somehow you owed him and that he owes you and you never sort this out, that the shepherd's got to own the sheep. And I think it's important to start here because... We're going to talk about some of the beautiful blessings that comes from having the Lord as your shepherd, but none of them relate to you if he doesn't own you, if you're not marked by him. Does that make sense? You know, on any given weekend, we have all kinds of folks that come in here and, you know, want to get a little taste of religion or a little bit of Bible or a little pick-me-up for the week, and they're not owned by the shepherd. To be owned by the shepherd is to submit to him. To be owned by the shepherd is to be marked by him, by his blood, by his love, 
by his life. That's important. Shepherd owns a sheep. Probably the bulk of this little poem is, is we see that the shepherd cares for the sheep. The shepherd cares for the sheep. You know, this is part of the shepherd's duty is to take care of the sheep so they're not scattered, so they're not lost. So when they start using what little brains they have to try to figure out how they can make life go better, the shepherd's got to help bring them back. And that's where we see these beautiful lines. The first one, it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, right? He finds me a good place to rest. So I was studying a little bit about sheep so you didn't know that you were going to come on a weekend at the tabernacle and hear all about ranching, but here we go. Do you know that sheep won't lie down if they're afraid? They won't lie down if they're afraid. They won't lie down if they're aggravated, if, if like bugs or pestilence is aggravating them. They won't lie down if there's conflict going on with other sheep. The sheep won't lie down if their bellies aren't full. So now think about that. If there's no wasted words in Scripture, and this is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, David didn't even know it except from his experience as a shepherd, and he says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's how he makes me lie down in green pastures, free from fear, from aggravation, from conflict, freedom from hunger. He leads me beside still waters. You know, growing up in the land that I grew up in, in Haiti, I have images of people leading flocks, not of sheep, but of goats, but shepherds nonetheless. Or you see these images the same way and how one will manage all of them together. If you're a sheep that's owned by the shepherd, you let him lead. Can you imagine if the sheep are like, no, I got this. I'm gonna take over here for a minute. And again, if I could draw comics, I'd have had some comics up here of a sheep like thinking he was the boss. How silly is that? Have you ever seen a sheep back on his back two legs? It looks silly. Know your place. It's the shepherd that does the leading. It says that he restores my soul. What does that mean? Well, I think we could spend some time and probably weeks and weeks on that, but where I am in my own journey, can I just be honest with you? I think it means that if I let God lead and if I trust him to lie down when I'm, or to make me lie down where I'm supposed to lie down, that the Lord satisfies. The Lord satisfies. Now, my wife's not here this evening, so I can say this. I don't want anybody to freak out. I don't, well, I'll just say it. I'm 50 years old. Somewhere around this age is when you start looking around, have I done enough? Have I come from enough? I'm more dead than I am got years ahead of me. Are you with me? That's when we start getting sports cars and freaking out, right? But if there's no wasted words in Scripture, there's a promise right there that it's the Lord that satisfies. It's the Lord that will restore my soul to that first joy. That's what the shepherd who owns me does for the sheep. Verse 3, it also says that he leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads me in the right way. I don't know how many times I get bent out of shape or I get all twisted up because I try to do things my way. Because, you know, I'm a pretty smart guy and it's my life and you know what? I deserve better. And so instead of doing it God's way, I do it my way. And my way, I don't know the path. I, I don't know the paths of righteousness. But the shepherd does. And if I trust him... I'll have that restoration in my soul that I desire as well. Verse four is the kind of the climax, it feels like, of the poem when he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But it's not because I'm a tough guy. You gotta read the next phrase. I will fear no evil for you are with me. How many times have we said the moment you receive Jesus Christ by faith and his grace transforms you, the same spirit of God that raised him from the dead takes up residence in your heart. 
The presence of God in our lives is a powerful thing. Just before the service tonight, I was talking to a bro that's experiencing the leading of the Spirit in more powerful ways than more than he ever could have imagined just a year and a half ago. And he was telling me story after story, and then this happened, and then this happened, and I could just feel this, and it was, like, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. And I just said, yeah, that's the Spirit. That's the presence of God in you. It's not about you anymore. It's God's presence in you. Why do you have no fear? Because you're a tough guy? No, none of us are bulletproof. And the only reason that we're immortal is because God's Spirit lives in us. And He's promised us that He'll save us for all eternity. He says, your rod and your staff they comfort me. Now, this was interesting because uh, Pastor Britton and I uh, were working on this a little bit, a little study on this this week. And uh, most of our images, go with me there for just a second. Most of our images of a shepherd is he just has a crook or a staff. But we forget that he also has a rod. And so with a little study, you start looking, and, and most of these first century shepherds, and this is what we have to go on because this is the poem that David's basing it on, his own experience, would have both a rod and a staff. And that translation for the word rod, the rod was more like a club. Or if you're a Louis L'Amour fan, like uh, Pastor Ben Brown, then it's more like the peacemaker, you know, the six gun back in the Old West. You with me? That's like the old, I mean, that's the protection, but then you'd also have the longer stick. The longer stick is for the sheep. Uh, the six gun is not. The rod was for defense, to defend the sheep against the enemies that want to scatter them, that want to devour them for the wolves, for the lion, for the bear, for, for the bad guys that are coming after them. And so where does my comfort come from? The fact that my shepherd who owns me, he cares enough for me to defend me. He doesn't use the rod on me, but he does use the staff. Now the staff you use, and, and Britain was telling me about in Oklahoma, when you see him when they're prodding and pushing and giving them a little tap here and there to get them to go where they need to go, guess what that is? That's the shepherd's discipline. We love to hear about how the shepherd defends us, but what happens when the shepherd has to use one of those utensils on the sheep? Both of those are care, friends. And many times when, at least in my life, when I feel the discipline of God, I want to run away or get bitter or resentful instead of understand that the shepherd is caring for me. What does it say in the book of Proverbs about, uh, um, about disciplining our children? What does our own Proverbs in America say about disciplining our children? If you don't discipline your child, you don't love your child. It doesn't mean you over-discipline them, but it doesn't mean that you become their best buddy. You're supposed to be a parent. It's the same thing with the shepherd and the sheep. There's a difference, and sometimes the shepherd has to defend the sheep with the rod, and sometimes the shepherd has to discipline the sheep with the staff. We've got to have both, and both of those are care. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, there's been books written about Psalm 23 and a book that I read one time, I totally, I could, for the life of me, could not find the title or the author. So I apologize, have fun Googling it later if you're really into this. But this guy like spent all this time researching shepherds and sheeps and he, Sheeps, sheep, whatever. And he, he spent a whole lot of time on, what about this image? Isn't this where the metaphor breaks down that the shepherd somehow prepares a table for sheep? Well, sheep don't have opposable thumbs. What are they going to do sitting down at my dinner table? Well, he drew the attention to the fact that in the summer months in just about every place from Africa to Europe to the western United States, wherever sheep are kept, it's in the summer months that they take them off to the best grazing, which is found on the high plateaus, also known as the tablelands. And that's where they spend the summer. It's usually a protected area. It's a place that after the winter, the spring, it just blooms and it's lush and green. And when it says he prepares a table before me, he's already done the scouting. He knows what's best for me. He knows what I need. I've told you before, I'll tell you again. My, 
the future as I had it planned out had nothing to do with being a preacher, nothing to do with being a local pastor, and nothing to do with preaching as a local pastor in northern Michigan. But you know what? God prepared the table that he knew that I needed that would satisfy me in a way that I could never even begin to ask or imagine. And it's the same for all of our lives. He knows what's best. He's gone before us. He prepares a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies. And then he says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What does that have to do with sheep? You guys tired of talking about sheep yet? Just want to see if you're still there. Apparently, out of all the different types of things that can afflict sheep, the worst thing is something called a nasal fly. How disgusting is that? These little flies that pester them, that hang around their face, and they get in their ears. The problem is they get in their nose, and I'm not going to say the word mucus, but they get in there, and they lay their little eggs, and it can cause a big problem. The nasal fly and the sheep causes a big problem. In fact, there are stories of sheep that aren't cared for by a good shepherd or who haven't been anointed trying to get some relief and they're beating their heads against trees or rocks or anything they can find. You know, just like we are. You know, the Michigan deer fly, that big thing that's as big as an eagle and it's always right behind this ear. It's like th those things attack you. Well, imagine being a sheep and you don't have access to off. And the problem is, is when those little nasal flies get inside the sheep's nose, it causes infection, it can cause blindness, and it can actually uh, end up infecting other sheep. Well, check it out, first century. They would anoint the heads of sheep with an oil that was a disinfectant, but it was also an, a nasal fly repellent. And it would flow down and they would anoint all of those sheep in such a way that if they had been afflicted, it would bring healing. And it would heal them in such a way that they wouldn't infect others. Now think about the church. Have you met anyone in church yet who is afflicted? Who didn't hear about the grumbling and complaining quarantine? Well, the good news is, is when enough of us are not grumbling and complaining or whatever it is about, if we've been anointed with that oil and, and it's operating as a, as a healing, soothing thing for us, we're not passing on that poison to other people. Isn't that what the love of God does, the peace of God does, the joy of God? The imagery, I, I, I thought that was cool. Sorry to geek out on you there. But he anoints there head with oil and then it finishes surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life I was thinking about goodness and mercy what embodies goodness and mercy more than anything else better question who embodies goodness and mercy perfectly Jesus Christ and he says that this goodness and mercy embodied in the good shepherd will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, that sounds good, John, but I haven't seen it. That sounds good, but I haven't experienced all that anointing and restoration. I don't know about no tablelands. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. One more thing before we lose or we move to the last point that I think is important for us. Is all of the verbs in Psalm 23 are in the present tense. This psalm is for right now. This is the good shepherd, if he owns you, in your life right now. It's not someday. It's present tense. 
It's present tense. And this is made possible by the last observation. Not only does the shepherd own the sheep and care for the sheep, the shepherd gives himself to the sheep. He gives himself to the sheep. That's why he's a good shepherd. See, when John 10, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, the implication is there's also bad shepherds. And some of us are being shepherded by bad shepherds. Right? We're looking to that chick, the social influencer on our favorite social media site, or you know, we're looking to this government figure, this political guy, or, or you know, we're looking to our favorite talk show person, or to our favorite author. You just go for it. You know, any human model is going to let you down. But the good shepherd is different. And I know that there are, you know, there are Christian leaders in your life, men and women who are mentors or pastors or ministers that would count as good shepherds, but the good shepherd does something that no other person can ever do, is give himself completely to you. And the good shepherd gives himself to the sheep. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, when he took the bread and he broke it, he said, take, this is my body which is given to you. And when he took the cup, he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. No other shepherd gives himself, all of himself. And the great thing about Jesus is he held nothing back. We hold back because we're humans. We hold back because there's only so much of ourselves that we can give away. Eventually, you have to draw lines. You have to draw boundaries. I'm not Jesus, and neither are you. But he's Jesus, and he's the good shepherd. And this shepherd gives himself to the sheep, so we can experience that in the present, right now. These are real verses in his word where nothing's wasted. And in those last lines when he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's It's like there's a declaration there of my faith in him. And so when we think about faith, here's the thing. The shepherd will always be faithful to his sheep. The good shepherd will. Jesus, the good shepherd, is always faithful to his sheep. The question is, will I be faithful to him? Or am I going to be scattered because times are rough? Am I going to be scattered because of uh, circumstances? Am I going to be scattered because of fear? Am I going to run off and be led astray? Because any one of us, it could be any one of us. We can get discouraged. We start thinking we deserve better. Something over there is shiny or pretty or or looks more satisfying. And then the next thing you know, we're, we're wandering off. And we need the staff to come after us. Or some under shepherds that look like sheepdogs and have been to fight club. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And that's what care looks like. But the good shepherd, this shepherd, gives himself to the sheep. And so I wonder as we close is, is, is where are you at? Is he'll be faithful to you. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But for that to be true, I think as a sheep, I'm called to be faithful to him. I think we're called to be faithful to him as individuals, as men and women, as students, as children, as a church. We're called to be faithful sheep, to let him lead us, to let him be in charge for a while, to let him mark us, to mark our lives, to trust his presence. Yeah, I heard a story. I don't remember where I heard it, but the story of a little girl and uh, she's about four years old, a little blondie with curls, as uh, I remember the description. I think of my daughter, Gabby, when she had impossible curls when she was really, really little. And this child was in a church where they still had Sunday school class, and they were talking about Psalm 23. And the teacher, uh, she was on the younger end of the class, and so the teacher said, uh, does anybody know the, the, the Lord is my shepherd? And this little blondie was like, I do. And she's like, do you know all of it? Yeah, I know all of it. And she said, do you want to recite it for us? Yes. And so she's kind of doubting that this is actually going to work, but she gave her a shot. A little blonde, curly-headed, four- or five-year-old comes up to the front of the class, and this is what she recited. 
She said, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. And then she went and sat down. And of course, the teacher's wrecked. Because isn't that the heart we're supposed to have as sheep? Lord's my shepherd. And that's all I want. And this good shepherd owns the sheep. I don't own him. He owns me. He cares for the sheep. I got to trust that. I got to trust that. And this shepherd gives himself to me. And that transforms our everyday lives. That's just not pie in the sky poetry. That's for real. So this is what we're going to do. The band's going to come and we're going to We're going to worship some more, but I'm going to ask for audience participation. So I need everybody to just go ahead and stand up. Oh, I know. It's just like dad jokes. Really? We got to do it? (laughs) And what we're going to do is we're going to go old school. It's Christmas. Can we not go old school? Is that okay with you? Can we go old school for a minute? Yeah. And what I want us to do, do we still have screens? Yeah, we got screens. We're going to read it together. Last week, we did the response. I read one, you read one. That was to break you in for this week. We're going to read it together as a prayer, as a declaration. Maybe you don't even believe all of it yet. That's okay. That's all right. Maybe you believe it with all your heart or maybe you're somewhere in between. But I'd like us together as a declaration, as a prayer. We're going to read it together loud and proud. Can we do that Saturday night church at the tabernacle? Come on. When a preacher's asking you, you don't know what's going to happen. You might hit a snowplow on the way home. So let's have good attitudes about this. I hope you don't, right? So all together, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.